This is a practice that is intended to transform your life. This is a practice that's intended to allow you to experience a transcendental experience. Transcendence. Transcendence means that you transcend the condition. You transcend the identity of the body and experience the truth. And the truth is that you are the awareness itself. You know, so the question is, in, and this is a good question, it's an important question, because that, this is what it's all about, right? Human beings live in an upset state a lot of the time, right? And so if this practice and these teachings promise the possibility of peace, promise the possibility of not being stuck in that upset state a lot of the time, uh, then we have to come to an understanding about how that is so. In the Advaita Vedanta teachings, they really depend a lot on the process of getting knowledge. And the, the premise that they have in that particular approach is that the problem is ignorance. You know, the problem is that uh, you're ignorant, that you believe things like a child. You believe that you're something that you're not, like a child believes in Santa Claus. And so in the Advaita Vedanta teachings, they say you replace that ignorance with knowledge, and when you replace it with knowledge, the knowledge is the truth. The knowledge is the way things actually are. And that's important. However, without practicing what you have knowledge about, to realize it, to actually experience it as the truth, it remains conceptual. And a conceptual understanding of reality doesn't get you very far. You may be a, a well-educated sufferer, <laughs> but that's not going to change the suffering experience, right? So really what this is about is that as you go through the day and things happen, and when things happen that uh, are not consistent with what you want, when things happen, they're not consistent with the way you believe things should be happening, the good life. When things happen that are not consistent with that, we get thrown. You know, we go into an upset state, right? We start to experience a reaction in the body, and we start to experience a thought process that's reactive. Um, it might begin with, oh, fuck. Or it might begin with, oh my God, you know. It begins with some statement that indicates that you're now in this upset condition. Oh shit, oh my God. Why me? What's going on? I don't like it. I don't want it. This shouldn't be happening. So that's a state of suffering. And that's a state that happens for most human beings consistently throughout their lives from little things to big things, you know, from a leaky faucet to a heart attack, right? All those things will happen in a human life. So the question is when those things arise, when circumstances bring challenges to you, what, how do you deal with that? Do you go to your breath like you are going to the breath in the practice? You know, in other words, do you start practicing meditation by becoming aware of the breath? Or do you just, see it as it is. You just see things as they are, and because you're seeing things as they are, it loses its capacity to upset you. Well, the answer to that question is that it depends on where you are in the practice. If you're a brand new meditator, if you're a brand new meditator, you may not be far along on the path to do anything other than after the upset calms down to realize what happened. That might be as much as you can can do. But that still has value, right? Because you're seeing it differently than you would have seen it without the practice. You're seeing that you were in an upset state, right? And then once the mind calms down and the body relaxes a little bit, you come back to a, a, a calmer state and you realize, wow, I was just in, a, in an upset, I was just in a storm emotionally and psychologically in a storm. And when you're in that state, it's very uncomfortable. People get become impulsive, you know, they do things to try and stop it right away, you know, or they start to depend on ways to alter their experience like prescription medication or marijuana or alcohol or sports or 
sleep or food, you know, there's no end to how many things can be used to try and alter your state of consciousness. <coughs> Ideally, you know, it, what this practice has to offer is if you, if you understand the importance of the practice and if you understand the difference it can make and you're doing it consistently and you're doing it correctly, um, there will be a natural process in which the things that disturb you start losing their ability to do that. Uh, because you can be, when an upset begins to occur, you can witness it instead of experience being the one that's upset. Uh, that's the transcendental experience. You're transcending the identity. That's what we're up to in meditation, transcending the identity. You know, uh, I always go back to this famous saying by one of the most famous teachers of spirituality and consciousness, where he said, this is not freedom for you, this is freedom from you. That's an important thing to take in and understand. This is freedom from you. Well, why would I want to be free from myself, right? Because the you that you consider yourself to be, the you, the you that you take yourself to be, is a problem. It's a problem because the you that you take yourself to be is very limited. It's in a survival mode all the time, right? So it's trying to get around things, through things, you know, control things, escape from things. Um, and so this limited form that you find yourself in, this physical body and the psychological identity that you consider yourself to be is a problem because it causes suffering, right? Because it's involved in a thinking activity that generates expectations, generates ideas about the way things should be and the way things are and the way things aren't. And so it creates a life that is suffering. A famous saying in regard to this is that there is a presupposed, a presupposed, in other words, you, the supposition has already occurred, you, right? you have already supposed yourself to be this non-existent being. There's a presupposed, you've been conditioning, conditioned to take yourself as this non-existent being. And then that non-existent being seeks freedom for that non-existent being. This is, really, this is really important to understand because in that one statement is the whole issue. You know, that you think you're something that you're not, and as that something that you're not, you're trying to be happy, you're trying to be free, you're trying to have peace. As that something that you're not. And not only is it as that something that you're not, but that something that you're not literally does not actually exist. This is, this is why the teachings are so important, because if you get this, if you catch this, right, and you really understand the, uh, the importance of understanding this, you'll realize that this is the key to the kingdom. This is the key to the kingdom. If you understand that the reason happiness is not yours to experience is because you're being a ghost. Ghosts cannot experience being happy because ghosts don't exist. So this non-existent being seeks freedom for the non-existent being. This is what happens when somebody begins to learn about the teachings and the practices and they begin to do the practices. In the very beginning, it's you as a personality hearing the idea that, oh, this can get me something. Me as a personality, this can get me something. This can, this can help me to stop being nervous. This can help me to stop my migraines. This can help me to sleep better. This can help me to be better in my relationships. And so I want some of this. That's the only way it can begin because that's where you start out from. You know, you start out from the presupposed being. You start out from being the body. You start out from being the personality. And you've been living your life as that. And if you're gonna be brutally honest, you have to allow yourself to admit that it's an unworkable situation to live your life as that. No matter what you get, you're never satisfied. And then your behavior is bad because you take things wrong, you, know, you, you take things personally, and you react to things, and that creates conflict, and so your relationships aren't very workable. Right? And it's a, it's, a, it's, a bi, it's a bi-directional thing. You and the people you're trying to relate to right, are, are stuck in an identity that's unreal and doesn't actually exist. 
And because you're operating in a, in, with a program, the program that's running in the mine is a survival program, so anything or anybody that occurs to you to be a threat to your well-being and your survival and your identity, you react to. The system, the nervous system reacts to it. You go into a fight or flight or freeze mode, right? And this is an uncomfortable experience, right? Especially when you're having it with people that you love, people that you're close to, and you go into a fight, a, a, you know, a fight or flight or freeze mode with the people you love. And of course, once their system detects that that's where you're at, their system goes into a fight or flight or freeze mode. Now, and, and now the two people who have a commitment to love each other and be related to each other in a, in a successful manner are now opposite teams on the game field, are now opposite countries at war. And it takes over. The energy spikes up, the anger spikes up, the perception narrows down, right? You can, you're only seeing things now from a very narrow perspective, right? And you are helplessly and impulsively going to behave in a way to try and control the situation, avoid being dominated by the other person, and dominate the other person. This, this exact dynamic explains the condition that we're in in the world. Country against country, nationality against nationality, race against race, man against woman, right? That's what's going on every day in the world. You know, people are lost in the sauce. People are completely identified with a reality that, is, that does not exist. Completely, people are completely identified with a reality that does not exist. And that reality is getting generated by all the minds of the people, right? Thinking, of, thinking that reality up. And then they have a collective version of that reality that we're all thinking up together. And therefore, we believe it must be true and it must be real because if we're all thinking it together, we can't all be wrong. Oh, yeah, we can. <laughs> we can all be wrong. The, the evidence is there, you know. The, 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 the evidence is there. This herd is running off a cliff, right? So, you know, just because there's a large number of, of people that are ignorant, that doesn't make ignorance wisdom. It's still ignorance and it still doesn't work. So the motivation to do this practice is to come out of this condition in which you're stuck in a very limited identity, uh, considering yourself to be the physical body and the personality, to come out of that so you can begin to be a witness to it instead of be at the effect of life. You can be a witness to it instead of suffering the drama that goes on in the world and suffering the drama that goes on in your life. When that begins to happen, you experience humility and gratitude. When that begins to happen, you experience humility and gratitude. You're very happy to give up being in control, right? Because you realize the idea that you were in control was an illusion. You ne were never actually in control. All you get to do is do the dance, that's all. All you get to do is dance with the situations that arise in your life. You know, when I was on my way over here this morning, I had an experience that left me with gratitude, right? I was driving the car and at one point I looked down and I saw the, there was a light blinking and it said, check transmission. <laughs> that's, for most of us, that's not a good sign, right? <laughs> check transmission, right? And so my mind immediately started to go into, okay, how much is this gonna cost? Do I need a new car? Is this gonna break down before I get to where I'm going? <laughs> right? But the reason I experienced gratif feeling gratified was because I, I was watching that instead of being that. I watched that. I watched the mind start to go into a reaction, right? But I wasn't identified with it, so I wasn't upset, right? And I saw it go into a reaction, and I was just watching it go into a reaction. I wasn't trying to stop it or control it, but I knew what it was. And because I knew what it was, it didn't affect me. I could be in the, a witness position. I could be in the position of being aware of it, but not identified with it. This is what these practices have to offer us. And when I had that experience, I experienced gratitude because you know, I didn't fall into the trap. I didn't fall into the hole. 
And so this is the difference it makes. If you start to experience transcendental wisdom, if you start to experience your true nature, if you start to experience the way things really are, you can relax. You can relax because there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it. The only thing you can do is witness it. And if you succeed in experiencing your true nature, witnessing it is, is a very comfortable experience. Nothing's happening. If you get down to the core, if you get down to your actual nature in terms of the awareness itself that has no form, it has no shape, it has no age, it has no gender, it has no needs, it has no desires, it's never upset, it's not going anywhere and it didn't come from anywhere. All it is is just here. It's, it's, it's just isness. It's just isness. If you can have that experience on a consistent basis, right, you're free. What are you free from? You're free from who you thought you were. And who you thought you were will still play in the mind, right? That's okay. It's just a puppet show. It'll still play in the mind, right? But it's not you anymore. And so when it tries to run programming to make you be crazy and to make you run or fight, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't mean that you will never run and you will never fight. But what it does mean is you, when you run and when you fight, it'll be because there is a real threat, not an imagined threat. When you run and when you fight, it's not because somebody said something that upset you and you want to kill them for it. No. If you run and you fight, it's because there is a real threat to your physical body or a real threat to your well-being. And because you can see the difference, one of the things that happens is there's very seldom situations that are real threats. And so, uh, and so now, most of the time, you can be relaxed and calm, even when that stuff plays, because you're awake and aware, and you can look at it and see that it is not a real threat. And so you, you don't get involved. You don't log on to it. You don't start to you know, run an operation, a military operation, in order to kill off the enemy. Going from being completely asleep and completely identified with your body and your mind to being totally awake, you know, that's, that's a, 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 a process that you're, you're, you're developing through the practice of meditation, right? So one of the things that you have to be aware of is that you, you may not be totally awake, but you're awake enough to know when upset is occurring, and you're awake enough not to identify with that upset. Now, if your car breaks down every week, okay, it may, it may be more challenging to stay awake, right, okay, and you may lose consciousness and go into the upset state, right, for a period of time, right, but then you'll calm down eventually and come out of it, right? So that's the way it goes, right? But the, the thing, that, the thing that, that, to, that, that you really want to be clear about here is that uh, what, what's the difference between being awake and not being awake? Not being awake means that you're upset, you're relating to what's happening like it shouldn't be happening, you don't want it to be happening, you're going to struggle with it, you're going to cope with it, you're going to try and control it, all this other jazz, right? Uh, and that's unpleasant, that's suffering, that's what, that's what we don't want. When, you know, that, that gets in the way of being able to experience any kind of well-being. So once you practice meditation and you understand what you're doing and you understand the difference it can make and you start to pay attention, not when you're just doing formal meditation, but when you're in the world, when you're in your life, you start to pay attention and you start to notice what I'm pointing at. You start to notice that there's a voice in your head that is not necessarily operating consistent with your best interest. There's a voice in your head that's not necessarily operating in your best interest, and therefore you ought to pay close attention to it so it doesn't lead you down the wrong road, like it has, like it will if you, stay, if you don't, don't wake up, right? So as soon as you get that, and as soon as you see the possibility and the difference it can make from practicing relaxing the body and calming the mind in meditation, and, and, and opening up the realization of the reality of what you are, and you bring that to your experience of living your life, then you start to see things from little things to big things. You know, you start to see little things that cause you to be upset, and you start to see big things that cause you to be upset. You start to notice, for example, that no matter what the weather is, you're still happy and calm and relaxed and satisfied, right? even when the weather uh, report says it's going to be nasty today because it's raining. 
You know, the weather report's a good indication of the collective consciousness that people are experiencing, right? Because they don't just tell you the weather, they tell you whether it's good or bad. They don't just tell you the weather, they tell you that it's beautiful or it's terrible, right? And they mean that. They mean that. When the weatherman says it's, it's going to be miserable today because it's raining, right? They mean what they say. Yeah? And so there's this collective understanding that, okay, today is not going to be too good because it's raining. Water's coming from the sky. Terrible. Right? So that's a little thing, right? If you can take it from the littlest thing like that and then take it to the biggest thing like your death, that's the biggest thing, your death, right? That's why in a lot of these practices and teachings, they go right to the big thing. They go right to the big thing and say, and say start paying attention to your death. Your death has already happened, by the way, right? Because one of the things you learn in these practices and teachings is that everything that exists is already in existence, the past and the future. Everything that exists in the eternal moment is already in existence. Therefore, your death has already occurred. The question is going to be, when that comes, right, do you experience that you're dying, or have you woken up, and when the body dies, you're there to witness it, but it's not you. If you believe the body is you, when it dies, you're dying. So the, the, one of the basic understandings in these teachings and practices that we have, have to break our attachment to and break away from is the idea that this flesh and blood thing is what I am. There is no self in this body. You know, th th this, these are, these are the, this is the heart sutra. Right? There is no self in this body. This body is an object, you know, that came out of another object called the mother, right? It's an object, right? And because, it, uh, because awareness has, I, has identified with it for a brief period of time called a human life, because awareness has identified with it for a brief period of time, right, the, the, the experience is that we take ourselves to be that body, right? So that, that is the beginning of the uh, delusion. It's the beginning of the um, mistake, mistaken identity. It's inevitable. It's inevitable, and it's not wrong. It's not bad. It has to be that way because we can't experience a human life in the world of time and space without identifying with the body. That has to be so. You also have to have a personality, right? You have to have an individual identity in order to exist in the world, right? That's not a problem, right? The problem is that after that process occurs, you know, almost all, none of humanity, almost all of humanity stops there. And they just experience things in that way, that I am this body, I exist in time and space, you, I, you, you're, you're separate from me, the world's separate from me, and that's the story, and that's the situation that's occurring, and that's the situation um, that I'm trying to get happy in. That's the situation that I'm trying to experience peace in, that I'm trying to experience satisfaction in. And if you're going to be brutally honest, you'd have to admit that it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. You know, you get brief periods of what we call happiness, which is actually gratification, because most people believe that happiness is getting what you want. So you have brief periods every time you get what you want, and the bigger it is, the better it is, right? But it never, ever lasts. Because why? Because it's a situation, it's a circumstance that you got what you want, right? And circumstances change. They keep changing, right? So it can't last. The only possibility for a lasting experience of well-being is the experience you have of yourself as awareness itself. Awareness is, it, where, awareness is in a state of well-being at all times. Awareness is, is happiness itself. It's not pursuing happiness, it is happiness. It is peace. It's not pursuing peace. It is peace. Right? So that's the natural state. That's what's called the natural state. It's that way naturally, right? And so you don't have to do anything to experience that except to wake up and realize who you thought you were isn't what you are. And then allow yourself to realize that the awareness that's aware of the body and aware of who you think you are is what you actually are. Hmm? And when you begin to to reorganize the way you're living and the way you're seeing things from that real place, life starts to work. Life starts to work, right? So most of humanity doesn't, doesn't get to the last phase, right? And for, for, for 
some reason or for no reason, you, you've uh, heard this message, right? You've been exposed to this message, right? And those who are exposed to this message, some people hear it, you know, that famous saying, let those who have ears hear, right? Some people don't have ears to hear it, right? They, they can only hear the translation that their mind keeps making of it, and it turns it into something other than what it actually is. So for some people, this message won't get through, right? For other people, it'll get through, and they kind of get it, and they kind of are interested in it, and they kind of want to do it because they think that it's going to get them somewhere that they want to be, but that's not good enough to deal with the challenge of practicing meditation and what it takes to continue to study the truth and everything. So those people die out. And then there's the last group of people that hear the message, they get the importance of it, they make an absolute commitment to doing the practice and they're diligent about it and they do it consistently and they start to experience the awake state. Yeah. And once you're in that position and you start to experience the awake state, you don't need to worry about being motivated because you've had a taste, you've had a taste of the truth and you know it's real, right? And now your commitment is to practice meditation not only formally but informally. Your commitment is to stay awake. Your commit commitment is as you go through your life and you're being challenged with the things that will upset most people, right? You're paying attention in such a way where you're, you're witnessing the, the situations that are occurring, right? But you're not logging in to being the personality trying to dominate or control or avoid being hurt by the situation. You're just relaxed. You're relaxed and you're experiencing things as they really are now. And because you're experiencing things as they really are now, you're not suffering. And that makes life worth living, right? Well, who was it that said, you know, an unexamined life is not worth living? One of the Greek philosophers. It's true. It's true. If you don't stop and, and ask yourself, who am I and what am I doing here? You don't even have a place to start from. For most people, all they want to do is get this over with. And actually, that's, that's a good idea to get this over with, get, to get over with the idea that your physical body and your personality, get that over with. If you get that over with, then you can be awake and enjoy being alive.